Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I am one of the AF Fellows this year. Here tonight to discuss law enforcement, maintaining order, and policing in the U.S. is Professor Lucius Outlaw, Jr., Professor of Philosophy at Vanderbilt University, where he has also served as Director of the African American Studies Program and Associate Provost uh, for Undergraduate Education. Prior to joining Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt faculty, Professor Outlaw was the T. Wistar Brown Professor of Philosophy at Haverford College, where he had been a member of the faculty since 1980. Professor Outlaw's teaching and scholarly interests include race and socio-political life in the United States, the legacies and practices of European and Euro-American philosophy, social and political philosophy, Africana philosophy and the works of several authors, including Martin Delaney, W.E.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, and Booker T. Washington. Professor Outlaw's Athenaeum presentation is a part of the Race and Law Enforcement in America series. As always, audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Outlaw to the Athenaeum. How's everybody this fine evening? I trust you're all well? Good. The situation was one in which white men especially often went to jails, paid the fines of the black people who were jailed for whatever supposedly impropriety they had committed in breach of the law, took them out and put them to work. And they had to work for this white person because the white person had paid their fine, got them out of jail, and so they owed the white person. There was a particular instance in which one white man who was known to be what was called a really mean white man in the way in which he treated black people, had gone to a jail and gotten this black man out and was working him in. Supposedly the black man didn't work quite the way the white man thought he did, so the white man took a whip and beat him viciously with the whip. As the person writing about this said, he had beat the wrong man. The black man went and got a rifle, came back, and shot the white man twice in the chest and killed him. As a result, a whole group of white men, including one of his brothers, other prominent white men, went on a raging lynching expedition and began killing other black people who had nothing whatsoever to do with the occasion of the black man shooting the white man. One of the black men that was killed, that was lynched, who had nothing to do with it, also had a wife. The wife became very upset about what had happened to her husband and said, if I can find out who's going to do it, I'm going to do my best to have them arrested. She was pregnant. She didn't have time to have them arrested because the raging lynch mob came for her. They came, they took her, they stripped her naked, they tied her legs together, they hung her upside down, and they set fire to her. Someone in the crowd noticed that her body was convulsing, so they took a knife and they cut open her stomach and the baby fell out onto the ground. As the story goes, the baby cried tri twice. Then one of the men in the crowd stepped forward and stomped the baby's head into the red Georgia dirt, killing them. That was before I was born in Mississippi. That story is recounted in Carolyn Alexander's White Rage, which is a recounting of 
among other things, lawmaking. But I'll say more about that. During my childhood in Mississippi, once I remember an, an occasion when one street over from where I live, lived a family headed by Reverend Shaw, who was also a carpenter and handyman. Reverend Shaw lived right next to one of my maternal aunts. One day, the police came to Reverend Shaw's house with a white man who said that Reverend Shaw owed him some money or something, called Reverend Shaw out in front of his house. And the police stood and watched while the white man beat Reverend Shaw in front of his family, in front of his house. Some years later, actually it was the Saturday before I would leave my hometown, driving with my parents to Nashville to begin my first year at Fisk University. Saturday afternoon, and a typical Saturday afternoon where, you know, after whatever you've been doing all day, you get all cleaned up and you get ready to go hang out with your friends on a Saturday night and, you know, talk for a little bit before you go make your runs to pick up your girlfriends and boyfriends or whatever. So I left home in my father's car and I lived a block away from a major highway. So I had turned onto the highway, one of my friends was walking down and I turn on a turn signal and pull over to the right to pick up my friends. Hey, you wanna ride downtown? She said, yeah. While I was sitting there, a highway patrol car drove past me. Then a second highway patrol car pulled up behind me. The officer in the second car got up and walked over to my side of the car and looked in and said, boy, you didn't give a signal. I said, sir, uh, turn signal is on. He said, I said, boy, you didn't give no damn signal. Yes, sir. By this time, the first patrol, highway patrol car stopped and just backed up and a young white patrol officer got out and stood around and listened. The older white officer went back to his car, sat down and wrote a ticket and finally walked back up to the car and handed me a ticket. I was parked on the highway next to an open field where as kids we had played, pick up football and things, you know, and et cetera. So he handed me the ticket and he said, now boy, the next time I stop you, you know what I'm gonna do? I said, no, sir. He said, I'm gonna see just how far I can slap your black ass back up under those goddamn trees over there. You understand me, nigga? Yes, sir. Got in his car, drove on. It's 1963. Some 20 years later, I was on the faculty of Haverford College there, right across the street from the main entrance of the college, there's a small strip mall of shops. My wife shopped in there quite frequently, so she had gone in that particular day and had parked to go in to do some shopping. There were three little African-American boys out selling candy, trying to raise money for some purpose. Anyway, she went in on about her business and going out. So when she came out of the shop, there was a white policeman there in the parking lot. And he saw her and he said, hey, come here. Yeah, you, come here. Yes? What are you doing having those kids in here? You know there's no soliciting in this shop from all. She says, what are you talking about? Those kids selling the candy. I mean, why you got those kids? Those are not my kids. I don't have anything to do with those kids. Let me see your driver's license. No, why? I'm not showing you any driver's license. Now, by this time, I'm married to a black woman with a PhD. I don't mess with a black woman with a PhD. <laughs> so she refused. By this time, smoke is coming out of her eyes, out of her ears, out of her nose, out of her mouth. So she sashays into her car, gets in the car, drives across the street, pulls back. We lived on the Haverford campus for 20 years. Pulls up to the house, gets out, comes in storming. I've been out jogging. I'm now sweating and trying to catch my breath. She comes storming in, tears streaming down her face. She is fit to be tired. I'm like, what's going on? So she tells the story. Like, we got. I said, okay, let me shower. We shower. We get dressed. We drive a mile up the street to the police headquarters. I go in and 
knowing the rules of the game in there, I walk in and I don't say my name is Lou Outlaw. I say, my name is Dr. Outlaw and this is Dr. Frieder Outlaw. I'd like to see the officer who's in charge. Okay, he's on the second floor. His name is Fine. Tell him I'd like to meet with him. Okay, we're shown the elevator. We get off the elevator. We're met on the second floor by Sergeant, whatever his name is, who's the officer of the watch for that day. He meets us at the elevator and begins with an apology. Now, while my wife has come home with tears streaming down her face and talking to me, and I got to take a shower and change clothes and go back up, this police officer, when she leaves, he gets the license number and runs the license plate. Typical police action. He's got a computer right there in his, in his car. He gets an address. So he's sitting there. So he gets out and having to go in one of the stores and is talking to a young white woman who is managing the store. And his words to her is, oh, my God, I think I've made a mistake. What are you talking about? She said, I could have told you those were not her children. She shops here all the time. It's a shoe store. <laughs> Miss Frida likes her shoes. Right? She said, I could have told you those were not her children. She shops here all the time. I know who she is. Those were not her children. And his response was, I ran her license plate, and I got her address. Man, can you imagine what her house must cost? He then got in the car, drove down to the head police headquarters, went to the officer of the watch, and told the officer what he had done. Namely, I think I've made a mistake because based on her address, her house must cost a lot of money. Now, I recount these because I want to begin talking about law enforcement with the personal. I want to talk about law enforcement. Now, let me just check with you. How many of us share the conviction that the primary responsibility of law enforcement officers are to uphold the law, enforce the law and to provide protection, particularly of property people. How I many think that that's a, just a basic notion of what law enforcement is about? Overly simplified, that job is to uphold law and order. Make sense? But here's a question I want to engage members of the Anthony M. with. What are the laws that prescribe what terms of order? Law enforcement has the principal responsibility of enforcing the laws so as to preserve lawful order. My question for our consideration, what terms of order? Now, why that question? I was born in Mississippi in the 1940s, 44. I was only a couple of years younger than Emmett Till. For those of you who are old enough, know something about Emmett Till. For those of you who don't, particularly students, you need to know about Emmett Till. My life was forever marked by the murder of Emmett Till. Some of you may know that just recently a book has been published where the author interviewed the white woman that was at the center of the controversy that led to his death, allegedly because he got fresh with this white woman and was brutally murdered because of it. 
that she supposedly has now said the story about him getting fresh with her, in her words, quote, was not true. She had lied. He's been dead for over 50 some years now. Not gonna help him. This is where I'm born, in Mississippi. This is the Mississippi I'm telling you. Now Mississippi, as in virtually every state in this nation, has a nested level, levels of law enforcement. They're the local police, the local sheriff, the state police, there's a military, the National Guard, right? all within the state and with no locales. Local police, local sheriffs and constables, et cetera, state police, state militia, but we're at the National Guard, and depending on the state, there may be even federal military people in various states. So you've got these nested levels of law enforcement, those who enforce the law to preserve lawful order. Okay. Now, in the United States of America, we must look carefully and critically at the terms of ordering. Let me simplify. The United States of America was formed out of colonies as a nation state devoted fundamentally to white racial supremacy. Any disputes, disagreements? Let me say again. Fundamentally, the United States of America was forged out of settler colonies into a federated republic predicated on genocidal dispossession and dispersal of peoples who were native to the, to the continent, misnamed Indians because the fool who first encountered them thought he was in India, and I can't figure out why the hell we're still calling people Indians because he thought he was somewhere he was not. As though they did not have names for themselves centuries before he ever set foot within what they call the so-called New World. Why do we still call these people Indians? They had names for themselves. And upon the enslavement of hundreds of millions of people who were deemed by the philosophers, by the theologians, by the politicians, by the ordinary people as being subhuman. The organization of the United States involved as principles of ordering the supremacy of the white race the subordination of all non-white races in the country. And the laws were made to instantiate and preserve and to legally rationalize that supremacy and that subordination. So then what is law enforcement about if these are fundamental terms of the ordering? If the laws then formalize this ordering, then the keeping of law and order becomes fundamentally about preserving white racial supremacy. For most of the history of these United States of America. I want you to think about 
what this means if you're a person of African descent. You are legally property. I want you to appreciate, as Alexis de Tocqueville, at 24 years old, traveling through this country, observes and writes about in Democracy in America. As Tocqueville notes, enslaved Negroes who tried to escape enslavement to freedom are guilty of larceny. I want you to think about this for a second. As an enslaved person, as property of someone else, if you escape, you are guilty of larceny. What's the larceny? You have stolen master's property by escaping to freedom. You are guilty of larceny. By stealing yourself away to freedom, you are guilty of larceny. By law. By law. And this is what shapes our country for centuries. For centuries. One of the things about Carolyn Anderson's book is that she gives you a rehearsal of how the laws were formed and worked from the beginning across very great periods of US history. First, the laws that made for enslavement. And we know there's a dispossession of the native people going on, their genocide as well. You were a slave for life. We have a civil war. 700,000 plus people died in five years of fighting inside this country where the central issue is whether or not certain states shall be free to enslave other people they think are subhuman. People went to war to protect, quote, their way of life, which rested on the enslaved labor, the production and appropriation of wealth through unpaid labor of people across several generations. Legally, legally enforced, backed up by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. After the war, we get the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments. But then we get Bush v. Gore won. Actually, it wasn't Bush v. Gore. It was Hayes and Tilden. Many of you know about the Hayes-Tilden Compromise? Raise your hand. Presidential election, where there's no clear winner, and the election has to be decided in the House of Representatives. So a deal got made. The Southerners said to the Northeastern boys, said, well, okay, here's the deal. We will cast our votes such that your boy gets to be president. But in return, you are to move all of the federal troops out of the South. Remember, after the Civil War, the Union was organized and it really was running Southern countries because the Southern Confederates were regarded as traitors. Most of them thought that they were going to be taken out somewhere and shot because they were traitors. But in fact, they made a deal. We'll vote for your boy to be president. You get the federal troops out and let us run the South the way we know how to do it. Certain Northeastern boys said, 
Cool, we tired of this Negro problem anyway. Fine, deal. And the process of reconstructing after the Civil War that had white people involved in politics and in elected to office, et cetera, was rolled back, voting laws were changed, people were run out of offering, lynching went wild. And it's very interesting because I have never seen anyone write about Christian terrorism. Ku Klux Klan was a Christian organization. They were a white Christian organization. I don't hear any talk about radical Christian terrorism, but that's what was going on. I began with an example of that, and let's be reminded, lynching was so prevalent that white families packed picnic lunches, took their children to witness the lynching, and participated in having selfies taken, they weren't called selfies then, having their photos made beside the corpse, which they got prints of and sit around as souvenirs, and took body parts as souvenirs from the lynchings with their children present and watching. And it was all lawful. And the fundamental part of the argument was the lynchings were necessary in order to preserve order. Now, in the mid-1940s, the Carnegie Endowment said, we've got a real problem with this race stuff in this country. We've been through one world war, we're into a second world war. The Communists are using this as an argument against us. We've got to solve this problem. So they recruited a social scientist from Sweden named Gunnar Myrtle and said, look, we want you to come over here and lead a major research study about every facet of life in the United States involving the Negroes and help us figure out how do we solve the Negro problem. Just so you know, W.B. Du Bois had been petitioning foundations for years to get money to conduct a massive thorough, systematic study of the life of the Negro in the United States. He'd already shown what had be done with the first of his kind by doing what became published as a Philadelphia Negro in 1897. No foundation would give Du Bois some money. He was a radical. Gunnar Murdoch was a social democrat, but he was white. So they brought him over to do it. Now Murdoch leaves Sweden coming to the United States wondering what's going on with these Negroes? Why don't they just assimilate like other immigrant groups? By the time all the research studying was done and he had compiled it into this report, two volumes called An American Dilemma, published in 1944, the year that I was born. If you haven't read it, please do. I just went back to it just to read the chapter in volume two on the police. Myrtle figured out the Negro isn't the problem. The white man is the problem. And when it came to the police, he looked all over the south and the country and figured out there's something really interesting going on here. First of all, all the police are white. All of them are white. Right? Virtually never were they female. They were all male. The police stood for civic order, he says, defined in the laws and regulations, but they were there to support white racial supremacy. But the other thing about this white race, it wasn't that it was just legal, formalized into law, it structured customs and habits and sentiments that Tocqueville talks about. It structured ordinary relations for the most simple thing, like whether or not you could make eye contact on the street. He talks about it as the etiquette of race relations. Whether you could look at another person in the eye could be regarded as a breach of the protocol of white supremacy if you were a Negro. You were required not to look a white man directly in the eye, but to look down, to lower your eyes. Why? Because eye-to-eye -eye contact presumed equality. 
So Negro males were expected to lower their eyes, never to look a white man in the eye as though he were that white man's equal. The ordering of human contact was thorough. Thorough. As a kid, if I went to a store downtown and I purchased a product, you were the cashier. I handed you a $5 bill. It cost $4.76. I had to put the dollar bill on the counter. You picked it up from the counter. You went to the cash register, got the change, put it on the counter. I picked it up off the counter. Why? Why? Because we were never allowed to touch a white female. That is why Emmett Till was killed. Every aspect of human interaction had to be regulated by the principles of white racial supremacy. And the police were the enforcers of law and order. It wasn't just the police. Any white person, any white person could act with police authority. Any white person, especially any white male. And the courts would bag the police every time. Why? Because if they did not, the police would lose authority and order would be compromised. No matter how extrajudiciously the police functioned, they would be backed by the courts. Remember, even the Supreme Court had said, Negroes do not have rights that any white person is obliged to respect. Law establishing order. Policing was shaped by these agendas of lawful ordering, et cetera. There's a whole lot more to it. Again, I urge you, if you're not familiar with an American dilemma, the Negro problem and modern democracy, I would love to see the Athenaeum do a serious reading of these volumes over the course of a semester or two. That's some of the background history. What about the present? Clearly, police enforcement has become a heated issue. Ferguson, New York, Texas, Florida, California earlier, all across the country. So what I'm asking you to consider is, what is law enforcement about in our country today? First, we've got to go get the history. Let me just say, given all of these different states, the way the states fall into different regions, I talked about the nested level of enforcement from police all the way up to state police all the way up to militia all the way up to federal troops and et cetera. There are some complex differences across the country as a whole over this historic period in how policing was organized and how it was executed. So continuing with law enforcement compels us to have to look closely and carefully at every place in the country to understand the history as well as the present way in which law enforcement is organized and what the lawmaking is all about in terms of trying to prescribe the structuring of social ordering. What are the terms of order today? It's not all that it has been. What are where we think we should be? Yeah, it's one of our questions. 
I've talked about the enslavement of African peoples. We have a sense of when that was formally ended. But after a period of reconstruction, the reconstruction of reconstruction was designed to put people of African descent back into near conditions of enslavement after the Civil War. Lynching was rampant, so-called Jim Crow laws throughout the South, forcing black people out of politics, erecting all kinds of new rules so that black people were disfranchised, could not vote, et cetera. We don't get that worked out until the mid-1960s with a whole bunch of protests and marches and beatings and killings, and et cetera. And here we go again, having to deal with a whole new round of legal measures to structure voting so as to preserve political empowerment for folk, almost all of whom are white. Law and order. And how does this get enforced and by whom? There are significant differences across our country. Our country is becoming more diverse. People identified as white are becoming just a part of the plurality, no longer are the majority. Now some say this is causing some real perturbations to in the country. Some say that's why Donald Trump got elected. I think it's a lot more complicated than that because a lot of the so-called working class white people who voted for Donald Trump voted for Barack Obama twice. So I think we need to get inside and do a lot of close, fine studying to figure out what actually is going on and why. What was it that Donald Trump wasn't saying that was so persuasive? I think what he wasn't saying was as important as what he was saying. As I asked some of the young people at my table, make America great again, what is that last word doing now? What work is being done by the word again? Because it seems as though, oh, it was, but not now. So, okay, Donald, tell me what was great about when it was great. Because I want to know what was so great about the period you think America was really great. I haven't heard that from Donald Trump. I'm not likely to hear that from Donald Trump. The messaging is very skillfully done. He doesn't have to give you that accounting. All he has to do is get the emotions mobilized to want to be great again. I don't know what that's supposed to look like, except that I think we are beginning to see what some of the components of that may be. I am convinced that we are now in what some people call an inflection point in the history of this country with this new president. What's an inflection point? A point at which development is likely to be profoundly historic. And my worry is this is not going to be pretty. I am deeply worried about a presidency that may be well prepared to marshal power, enforcement powers, in a way that meets no criteria of being democratic. I am worried about a presidential election in which all of the, the intelligence agencies say we are in agreement that with a high degree of confidence that there was a systematic effort to influence the presidential campaign by discrediting Hillary Clinton and subsequently by assisting the presidency, the election of Donald J. Trump. 
Now, the Trump campaign says, look, there's no evidence that there was any vote tampering with the voting machines or the manipulation of the vote. Nobody claimed there was. The intelligence agency said, we have no evidence that there was any tampering with the voting of the voting machines and the, and the collect, counting of the votes, none whatsoever. But that wasn't their claim. Their claim is that there was a systematic campaign to influence the election. So I asked, was Donald Trump as a candidate influenced by the influence campaign of the Russians? The intelligence agency said, Russia's intelligence people were involved in the hacking of democratic computers and the release of information. Does Donald Trump make use of that released information? Does he? Does it become part of his campaign? So wait a minute. If that was an action of espionage by a foreign government to influence the election, a candidate takes the result of that and makes it part of his campaign effort, tell me how he's not being influenced by an influence campaign. How is he not a willing participant in what has now been disclosed as a deliberate campaign to influence the election of the President of the United States, and he's now the elected President of the United States? I start off talking about the United States as a white supremacist organized polity. Steve Bannon promoting ethnic nationalism. With the willful participant of explicit white racial supremacists. This is a chief advisor who now sits on the National Security Council on which to the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is now no longer a permanent member of the National Security Council. Instead, Bannon is, and another major military officer is out to be called when they want, but Bannon is there all the time. What in heaven's name are we up to now? So what's my point? I want to hear from you about law and order, the terms of ordering that get formalized by law that other people become charged with the responsibility to enforce. One of the things that Grinnell Middle said that I think is highly pertinent to the Athenaeum, I assume that this organization that you affectionately call the Ath has been guided by a conviction that Murdoch articulates at one point in the second volume of An American Dilemma, and I'm quoting, he says, we who are convinced Democrats, small d Democrats, we who are convinced Democrats hold that public discussion is purifying and that democracy itself provides a moral education of the people. I'm assuming that this assembly, all such occasions hosted and organized by the Ath, is about democratic discussion for the moral education, especially of our students here but of all who participate. That's my working assumption about the Athenaeum. You will tell me if I'm wrong.
based on that assumption that this is part of the fundamental mission of the act to pursue moral education through democratic public discussion, I must declare to you my profound thanks for the honor of inviting me to be a part of this venture with you on this evening for that introduction of the old man. I notice you didn't call me the old man, even though I authorized it. For those of you who turn out for dinner to hear an old man in whose presence you've never been before, I thank you for that vote of confidence. I thank you for your patient listening. I trust that you will share with me now some of your thinking to aid in my moral education. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm in trouble now. We now have time for questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and Sarah or I will come to you. Hi, thank you so much for your remarks this evening. Uh, where, oh, okay, Hi. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, that at the basis of a lot of um, philosophy, there is a lot of writing that describes um, certain groups as subhuman. So there are some quotes that I came across specifically from Human Rousseau, and you being a scholar and professor of philosophy now, I myself study philosophy as well. I'm wondering how you came to reconcile these writings that are at the basis of like our democracy, um, our politic, um, with these ideas that are, you know, based on pseudoscience and really awful things. Yeah, I mean, if I think I understand your question, um, for me the task isn't about reconciling them. <coughs> the task is about displacing them with new notions. Um, One of the things about which I'm utterly convinced is about how we understand human language using human conceptions. How may I articulate this? Um, that, uh, <laughs> sorry, about human language and human conceptions, right? So, uh, how many of you have read Plato's Republic, for example? Right? If you read Plato's Republic, you see there's a task underway. Right. There's a challenge that Plato is wrestling with. Right. He is worried that Anthes is in an inflection point, that it is teetering. His father and a group of his crew threw out a tyrant, claimed they were going to restore order and democracy, but then they condemned Socrates and he ends up dead. So Plato's like, wait, 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 whoa, what's up with this? Here are people who are supposed to be in charge of the very notion of the virtues in general, justice in particular. How can they bring on the execution by his own hand of Socrates? There's something wrong here. So he said, I got to get this stuff figured out. Now, if we follow the Republic on my reading, Plato is trying to figure out how do we deal with the contingency of human existence if we need guidance from some key notions. So his way of trying to resolve it is to say, well, if those key notions are anchored to something that is true and correct but unchanging, and we can grasp that and infuse the notions with that and put them into effect in ordering the political order, then we can get the political order ordered in correlation with these unchanging truths like justice. So for me, the per republic is an exercise of trying to figure all of that out. Now, in my judgment, it don't work. And it's not the last time people are going to try that. Take a look at the analytic movement in philosophy. They try it. They're going to purify language of all of them, good stuff, make it more scientific, building up on mathematical logic. Victor said, we're going to have a picture theory of language. We're going to have our language mirror the structuring of reality and the way we put words and sentences together doesn't work because that ain't, that ain't how language really works. Right? So I'm convinced that we are thoroughly beings of history. We are evolving, changing beings. The notion that we're going to grasp some universal, unchanging truth and order our lives by virtue of it, 
I think, is a failed quest. Now, let me just fess up. I got one foot in hell, nailed on a banana peel. I ain't going to nobody's heaven. I hope don't nobody bump me too hard anytime soon. So clearly, I ain't believing in the heaven and God. I don't. I don't. If it works for you, pray for me, but okay. But <laughs> I ain't going to pray for myself because I don't think, no, I mean, the praying may help. I just don't think the notion of what we're up to, right? right? So what is my, my point is that I think we're left with the contingencies of our own existence, and we're constantly struggling, hopefully evolving, to figure out the terms by which we can order our lives in such ways that we can flourish while also eliminating some of the stuff we regard as bad. I think that's an ongoing struggle. I don't think there will ever be a point at which we will be out of it. Clearly, I think there is progress. I used as an example my childhood about making things. If she had to make change for me right now, she wouldn't think that, oh, please don't touch me. I don't think that would even come into her mind. So we are a long way from where we used to be. Do I think there's progress in this country? Oh, yes, indeed I do. Do I think we are done? No. So I think this is an ongoing part of the human condition. Trying to achieve some steps forward Try not to let it all slip away and we slide back. That's why, to me, colleges and universities are utterly crucial to our project as human beings. Utterly crucial. That these places like Pomona and Pfizer and <clears throat> how many is on the Indian State University? How many? Five? Claremont, McKenna, I mean, that you bring people in as residents to live together for four years in ongoing, overlapping generations of people while the institution stays here and tries, we hope to get better and better at it. These experiments, I believe, are utterly crucial to our existence in this country, utterly crucial. These types of experimentation, bringing people together, building up knowledge, refining the knowledge, critiquing the knowledge, passing it on to successive generations who, in being having it passed on, also question and say, well, now, wait a minute, Trump, can you make that clear to me now? I ain't persuaded of that for sure. Oh, well, yeah, let me get my back on this. How could you answer this question? Well, not today. Let me go think on it and come back next session. And Okay, I think I have an answer for you. And that happens over and over. This, this. The act? Yeah, I know it harkens back to Fifth Circuit Greece. Is that right? I ain't opposed to that. <laughs> I'm not opposed to that. I want to celebrate that. I mean, look at this. This was not happening in Mississippi when I was your age. This could not happen in Mississippi when I was your age. So I'm celebrating the act. This is crucial. We have to keep working at it. We have to keep struggling over what the key terms mean. Who is human? Look at what has happened just in the last 10 to 15 years. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people can get better. I never understood why somebody could say, if two people of the same sex get married, it's a threat to my marriage to my wife. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> say, we want to go through the ritual of declaring our love, and we want our relationship to be sanctioned by all this stuff that we do that is called marriage. How the hell is that a threat to me and my wife? <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. I know I'm from Mississippi. I didn't go to Claremont McKenna, so there's some things I don't understand. <laughs> but I never got that one. People who say, we want our lives, our relationship, to be sanctioned and structured by the same public commitment of a man and a woman who get married. That's a threat. You weren't threatened when your brother, best friend, or whoever got divorced. <laughs> that wasn't a threat to your marriage. <laughs> so look what has happened to the notion of marriage. In my lifetime, in yours. We have taken that notion, expanded it to cover 
people. Where others are saying, oh, God condemns them. You're condemned by God. God told you that? You know, the stuff that gets done in the name of God. You know, you are God. You probably have to look down at the human race and say, what the hell? <laughs> we have to keep struggling, Lord. Expanding, revising. I take that to be part of the condition of human beings. And again, that this kind of enterprise is one of the most fundamental ways in which we keep doing that work. Unquote. Oh, the brother in the back of the church, now I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, I have a question on paradigm as it pertains to I have a question on paradigm and methodology, mm -hmm. the way it pertains to some place like this, or your own position at Vanderbilt, having a position in the philosophy department, um, also doing work in the Africana or African American Studies department. So here at CMC, we have no Africana Studies department. Um, we have very few professors of color, even fewer professors of African descent. Um, at Scripps and Pomona, we do have the department, uh, but Every single professor there holds sort of a dual position, right? A position in history and a position in Africana studies. A position in philosophy and a position in Africana studies, mm -hmm. right? And in this department, we're severely underfunded compared to a space like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have this debate, right, in Africana studies, which says, how do we define the discipline? Um, so the question is, should we have Africana studies exist on its own? You know, employ things like Kawaita theory, Afrocentricity, words that I didn't know existed until I saw them once. Or do we integrate them into traditional disciplines that seem to have much more of a history, much more of a canonical basis, things like sociology or philosophy or psychology? Because you tell us to read about Emmett Till, learn about Emmett Till, know Gunnar Myrdal. You want us to understand the Civil War. You want us to understand what law and order means. But if I wanted to learn about the Civil War and I read my Southern Elementary School textbook on it, <laughs> my middle school, high school textbook on it, my college history textbook on it, it would not be the same as learning about what Du Bois would have to say about it. So what's the problem with our methodology? Well, this is a serious and challenging question that's been you know, underway for a couple of hundred years that has to do with the politics of how we organize knowledge production, knowledge validation, and knowledge distribution. Another way of putting this, and, and I want you to hear me on this because it can sound to be simplistic and corrupting, uh, knowledge production is always political work. I'm in what is, I regard as one of the, has been one of the racist and most recalcitrant disciplines in the academy, and that's academic philosophy. I mean, it has been unbelievably knuckle-headed and recalcitrant as a discipline, simultaneously being one of the ones that cultivates the most arrogant simple-mindedness that still has persisted for too long in the academy. I mean, the arrogance cultivated in the discipline is just mind-blowing. And there's a lot of lying that has gone on in the discipline for a very long time. What I mean by lying, never telling the truth about even its canonical figures. Right. So again, my point is the organization, the production of knowledge, the organization of the production of knowledge, the mediation of knowledge to successive generations has always been governed in an Aristotelian sense by politics. What I mean by politics, in keeping with some notion about the interests that would be better served by doing it one way rather than another, by having some things in and some things not in. Knowledge production is an area of contestation and struggle. If you've got a country organized on the premises of white racial supremacy, right, and this goes on for hundreds of years, if the institutions in which knowledge is produced and mediated are structured 
by the principles of white racial supremacy, how is it that the knowledge producing and knowledge meeting enterprises in those institutions are not themselves infected by these notions of white racial supremacy and the inferior and subordination of other people with, uh, who come into the institution or who are kept out of the institutions? So part of the struggle around these larger issues also infect the disciplines. How are you going to organize the production and distribution of knowledge? Those are all decisions. What are the canonical figures? Pick any program of philosophy, whether it's at Claremont, McKenna, wherever. If you major in philosophy, there are a set of things you have to do. Who makes those decisions? Who's in? Who's not in? On what criteria? Who's in and who's not? Those become political issues. Now, the people are going to give arguments that are philosophical arguments as though those are not also representative of interests. Of course they are. Although those interests are not tied to notions about history and significance and all kinds of other stuff, of course they are. Cultivated across decades in institutions that have been structured by white racial supremacy, of course they are. So part of this is to try to figure out, well, okay, how are we going to wrestle with some of these kinds of issues? So we said the question, well, should we have Africana over here as opposed to having somebody doing Africana in the history department? Why is that an ego or question? Why is the question formed that way? Why isn't it, yeah, we got Africana over here and we got somebody doing something over here in history? Take the sociology department. Does the sociology department have a course in the history of sociology? Why isn't that being done in the history department? <laughs> so political science do history of political theory? Why isn't that formed out to the history department? point these questions become sometimes genuine intellectual questions, sometimes they are subterfuges for trying to prevent something from happening. Part of it is someone asked Charles Schumpeter, a Nobel, Nobel Prize winning economist once, Professor Schumpeter, how do you get major developments in economic theory? He said one funeral at a time. Okay, morbid joke. <laughs> One of my father's brothers had a funeral director, couldn't make that. What was his point? The point, overly simplified, is some of these developments are not likely to happen until we get new generations of people coming in to these disciplines who have different ways of thinking about knowledge production, who have different ways of thinking about what should the boundaries be of what is definitive of a discipline. So we got people who don't think, and I can tell you, if I take you to Vanderbilt University and take you over into the natural sciences, I will take you to whole multi-story buildings that are devoted to people who are pursuing subject matter in the natural sciences cross-disciplinary, who know that the issues they are working on cannot be pursued by trying to stick to the strategy of a single discipline that there is no way they can do the knowledge work they need to do or to resolve the issues they're trying to resolve by thinking that they have to operate by the agenda and the strategy of some single discipline, that it cannot be done. So they have to build physical structures that bring people together from different disciplines to work on these problems where the problems don't present themselves like, I'm a physics problem. So you know I'm the biologist. <laughs> no. Whatever it need is needed to understand the problematic and try to resolve it, those are just resources you bring together. Right? But if you look at academic philosophy, my goodness, at most institutions in the country, it's 
It's okay. I've been in the discipline for nearly 50 years. In many respects, it's absolutely okay. Now it's changing, has changed, right? But just think of this. Let's talk about, let's talk about that day in the black house. There is no such thing. So what do you mean there's no such thing? Black folks have never produced philosophy. Well, why is that? They're not thinking. Well, why is that? Well, in order to think like a philosopher, so here's an argument by a philosopher published in the New Journal, the Journal of the American Philosophical Association. Here's the argument. In order to think philosophically, you must have an IQ that is equivalent of the IQ of people who are well advanced in like mathematics or physics. Most African Americans, people in our church don't have those IQs, therefore they do not have the capability of participating in the discipline of philosophy, so we should not be involved in any kind of effort to recruit them in any form of action. They just don't have what it takes. If I were to walk you through a history of the mid-40s, well into the 80s and 90s about African philosophy, you will see the argument. Boldly stated, there cannot have been African philosophy before Africans encountered Europeans and Soviet Union because they did not have the wherewithal to think philosophically. Now, there's one prominent text written by a Belgian priest for the church to say, actually, they did have a philosophy. It was embedded in their language. They didn't know it was there. But because I have the philosophical creed by my church, I can extract their philosophy from their language and show you they have a philosophy. And when I present it to them, they go, oh, yeah, that's us. But they didn't know they had it themselves. It was implicit, but they didn't know it. Another French philosopher went to an African country, and I think of an African as well. He gave a lecture at an African university. He weighed in on this controversy. He said, in French, you don't have philosophy in Africa yet. You haven't met what he called the conceptual takeoff condition of the discipline of philosophy. Now, there are things about it. I'm a licensed pilot, so I had to think of what it means to take off. He said, you haven't met the takeoff conceptual condition required for the problem. He said, the European speaking to an audience of African students in their home country. Now, let's just say, my colleagues in Boston and Paramount McKenna do not ascribe to any of those methods of thing. Just be clear. I'm not writing about this <laughs> Just want to be clear. But the discipline has been problematic. But this is not just about that discipline. It's about virtually any discipline. It's almost farther along in people coming in different ways from refugees from different parts of the world to study philosophy. Disciplinary struggle has been intense since about the late 60s, all the way into the present. So many disciplines have been really substantially responsible over these struggles. Those struggles are still underway. Part of my point is that it's been interesting to me what a laggard academic philosophy was. How recalcitrant were people in the discipline working against these kinds of transformations. But this work is ongoing. This work of trying to figure out, and it, it really comes down to a decision about how do people want to organize knowledge production and teaching at Paramount McKenna. And all I'm proposing is there isn't any one right way to do it, nor do I think the question is an appropriate one by asking either this or that. Now, it may be a practical question. How many people do you have, and where do you want to spread the people out, and how do you do it? But part of it has to do with how you want to organize knowledge, how you want to organize the production and the mediation of knowledge within a college, how you want to distribute resources. And at the bottom of this, fundamentally, often, it really is a resource question. Who's going to get what money to do what? It really comes out often to a resource allocation question. Because if the money goes to Africana, it ain't going somewhere else. 
and then somebody always competes for the same thing. And it's not always just money. It's also prestige, recognition, who's on the marquee, all kinds of stuff is cabinet into it. Because remember, these institutions are devoted to the reproduction of the intellectual elite. That's why you're here. None of you came to Claremont McKenna because you thought it was the lowest institution on the total pole in America, right? Come on, tell the truth. Is that why you're here? I know I'm not in this room by myself. <laughs> Is that why you're here, students? But this is part of what is going on. There's a research question, there's a political question, there's an organization of knowledge question. Who's going to be in what kind of position with what kind of status about, and who's going to educate the young? Who's going to educate the young? And if you've got somebody in one knowledge production enterprise over there educating the young that are raising fundamental critiques about lots of other people in the institution, that's going to get a little interesting. Because in one sense, if you got Africana over here, what does that say about all the other departments and programs? Does that automatically mean they're all racist? You gotta work through that. So why are you isolating and segregating yourself? You segregate yourself from political science. You go tell philosophy they're gonna get buried with religion tomorrow. Are y'all part of religion? Go tell the philosophy department you're going to merge it with religion tomorrow. See what the response is going to be. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good. We, distinctions don't matter. <laughs> you're right. Part of the politics of knowledge production in the country. All of these are issues on which we struggle. Again, there are ways to struggle that I think is, I'm taking to be the way that that function struggle in ways that lead to our lives. That's all the time that we'll have for questions. And I do have to apologize that I am, in fact, not allowed to call you an old man. But I, I do appreciate it. And please join me in thanking Professor Outlaw.